Hello, hello, hello. Hello, it is showtime. Welcome to the show. This is the weekly spinner rack. Me, I'm your host, Chris. Thank you very much for joining me. We're going to do some comic book reviews. We're going to get into a lot of comic book news. I'm going to be chatting with all of you, taking your questions. I'm going to be drawing. This is going to be a good one. Forget all those other shows that you've seen before. Yeah, I admit, those are pretty garbage. This one? No, this one has my promise. It's going to be good. We've got some folks in the chat, so uh, I'll agree with some of you. Hello, how many salutes? Well, you're starting off with one. Let's see how many uh, people I have in the chat. Maybe we can get that up to uh, the double salute. Maybe. Maybe. Hello, fanboy. Hello, uh, A-man. Uh, this is going fast. Hello, Morataka. Hello uh, to Grace Spate. And we've also got Jordan Larson. We've got Joe Dent. Uh, let's see. Uh, digging the Teddy Fresh. Yeah, I got myself a new hoodie. They've got a sale going on. They've got like an early Black Friday sale. So I went ahead and got myself a new sweatshirt. Devil salute time. Why not? There's a bunch of you here. A boom, a bang, together, a boom. That's all for you. Thank you for being here. Let's see. Zach says, just got the Basil Wolverton Artist Edition in the mail. This thing is huge. Well, that sounds fun. That sounds very cool and unique. Yeah, I like it. Uh, Riv. <laughs> uh, let's see. And hey, hey, everyone there. That's very nice. Folks, thank you so much for being here. This is definitely going to be a fun one. Tell you what. Let me open something. Boom. What's that? That's my sloppy desk here that at least has some comics. I got a, I got a good amount of comics this week. I don't know about you guys. Always curious what's tops on your list. But let me start with talking about real quick. Um, this will be more like recommendations or not, like than, than really anything spoilery. But She-Hulk, uh, current series by Rainbow Roll. Normally is of course following the chili hero she's got sort of a romance and a business life and all sorts of cool stuff this is a really good pacing on the behalf of the writer rainbow roll with art by guest artist uh takeshi miyazawa who i haven't personally seen work on anything since runaways and uh it takes a moment instead of focusing on she-hulk to focus on these two new you might want to call them villains. They're definitely going to be enemies of She-Hulk. They're scientists that are trying to give themselves gamma powers. They're very smart. They also both have very big egos. And uh, it just talks about their whole plan on giving themselves gamma powers. They want to be Hulks. And uh, it doesn't quite go to plan. It, it does initially for just a moment there, and then it all goes to crap. Uh, and that makes them basically somewhat sympathetic uh, villains. So it is interesting. I admire the pacing on this where they're taking time out to give a whole issue to explaining the backstory of these new enemies. I think that that's really good pacing. So I like that. That is, uh, Fanboy says that... Uh, that is a thick leg. I assume you're talking about Jen Bartel's cover there. Keep in mind, this is a Hulk. <laughs> um, what else did we have? We have uh, Peach Momoko's new book, Demon Wars. To catch you up to speed, this is essentially Peach taking Marvel Comics ideas and together with co-writer Zach Davison, they're creating sort of... Um, well, they're adding Japanese mythology to it, uh, things like Oni and other uh, spirits and stuff like that. And the main character is uh, Mariko Yoshida, who was really just a supporting character in X-Men comics. But here she's the titular character, and they're taking on some ideas from Civil War. So we've got Japanese takes on characters like Black Panther, uh, Captain America, Iron Man. It's not the same story that we've seen before. It's it's just a riff on existing ideas. Um, how much you'll like it will honestly probably depend on how big a fan you are of Peach Momoko. 
obviously she has a lot of fans out there. So this is selling very well. She's doing great. I think it's an interesting book. I can't say I absolutely love it, but I do enjoy it. Uh, Peach is very talented. There's no question about that. And uh, yeah, so it takes uh, some Marvel ideas and spins them in an interesting way. And I think that the art is really, really engrossing. It's very unique. It really is. Oh, Jim Mafood, thank you for stopping in. Says, anybody pick up my buddy, my name dropper here. Uh-oh, we got a name dropper. Mateo Scalera's new Batman One Bad Day, Mr. Freeze One Shot. The art is all goes without saying with Mateo, I would say. Uh, Brilliant Colors by Dave Stewart. There's a reason the guy keeps winning Eisner's. Tight script from Jerry Duggan. Uh, I have not yet, but uh, that's because I basically I didn't see it. But that's the news. Let's see. Talking, I, I think this is Andrew talking about Peach Momoko's books here, saying artwork is really good. Thought the story was a little weak on the first volume. It it has interesting characters. The actual like narrative and the plot. It, it sort of varies how strong that is issue to issue. I sort of agree with you there. I watched your interview with Zach Davison a couple days ago. He's an interesting guy to, to hear from. Yeah. Let's see. Something weird going on with YouTube today. I got the notification, but the video isn't in my feed. That's a little bit beyond me. That's a little beyond me, I'm afraid. Uh, looks like some people responding to Jim saying, uh, uh, Dick Goblin's book. Um, Mr. Freeze One Dad Day is amazing, says level 87 code. Kyle says, bought it, haven't read it yet. That That's okay. I'm late. I was watching some crumb interviews. Well, that's totally okay. That's totally okay. Uh, let's see. I haven't yet, but I'm always down for Jerry Duggan books. Jerry is really strong. I'm trying to remember he did one book that was like a, a riff on the Odyssey, the ancient uh, story by Homer, um, but with like a military man. And I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head all of a sudden. But if you Google that, you might be able to find it. There's a really, it was like not a funny book. It was like just a very interesting, introspective type of book. Uh, yeah. Should try to get that Peach interview, Chris. That would probably be tough. I, I don't know her at all. She's so popular, and it would take a lot of coordinating to, um, you know, get her husband as well because, you know, he'd probably be working as her translator. Um, I know that the cartoonist Kayfabe Boys interviewed her fairly recently. I know Jim knows uh, Little Peach, Little Sister Peach. <laughs> But um, I, I've i seen her at conventions, but I haven't met her. But who knows? Maybe someday. Um, I'm sure it would be interesting. I, I would love to. But it, it's also, honestly, that one intimidates me a little. But, yeah, I would love to. Um, each of those Peach Demon books, number one, what am I missing? I wouldn't say all of them are, first of all. Uh, Demon Days, like, was, you know what? No, I take that back. Uh, they were. It's because while there is a continuum, Narrative. It's not a to be continued for the most part. Um, each one is exploring something a little bit different. The original Demon Days follow different main characters. Demon Wars is following Mariko exclusively. Ever heard of comics by Perch? He talks about the comic industry a lot, and I like his commentary. Um, I'm pretty sure I've heard of that channel, but it's not something I watch now. Is that Wolverine on the cover? No, just to go back one more time, that's a that's a take on Captain America. Now, he isn't Captain America. He's um, a Japanese spirit, but he's sort of got that same nobility and, and drive and passion and stuff like that. Yes, I'm getting into the reviews right now. Chris, I can connect you to Yo and Peach. We can discuss it through email if you like. Not sure about her availability, but it doesn't hurt to ask. That's fair. You know what? Um, I might take you up on that, but I have to like, I, I want to be so prepared. Oh boy. Um, maybe I should just do it in person. Uh, maybe I should go to Japan this spring and, and see if I could do it in person. Maybe that would be less awkward than over the, over this stuff. Let's uh, move on. 
folks, this was a pleasant surprise. I really recommend this book. This is called Murder World Avengers. Uh, Co-written by Jim Zub and Ray Fox. And I generally like Jim Zub's books, but I especially like this one. If you've ever read Marvel Comics, there is a villain called Arcade. And for a while, you know, he sort of dressed like a, a low-rent <laughs> joker. But he was always just this rich prick that would create um, hidden carnivals with robots and stuff. He was primarily an X-Men villain, but definitely went up against Avengers, Spider-Man. He's been out, you know, every once in a while, there there really has been a couple good stories with him. I think Avengers Academy was an interesting take on it because it was sort of like that um, movie, comic, and book Battle Royale, but with um, arcade running things. And um, this one, is it's going to be a series. They're all called Murder World, but then each one sort of features different robot versions of superheroes. What what we find out is that he does not exclusively go after superheroes. He holds these yearly things where he convinces like 200 regular, non-powered people to compete in a contest that only one can survive, and the winner gets how much? Two, $100 million. 200 contestants, $100 million, one winner. Look, in simplest terms, this is taking Squid Game and putting it into Murder World. That said, these guys pitched this years ago before Squid Game came out. Now that Squid Game's popular, Marvel's like, you know what? What was that idea again? It's fun. It's exciting. Uh, we follow a main character who ends up... Uh, having mutant powers so that's a twist there are more twists beyond that i really 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 like this it moves at a really fast clip call me dark it is a little bit horror tinged for like the superhero world but i thought it was a blast i strongly recommend it folks murder world avengers you don't need to know arcade's history if you do cool you know who he is this is its own original story <laughs> less money than the powerball true but uh a one in 200 chance is a lot better than when you play the powerball it's something like close to one in 300 million chances of winning so you've got a better chance of winning this one <laughs> i thought i'd recommend that one strongly um yeah uh uh it's let's see we're still pretty early on cheese years, so you say that you're a little late, but honestly, the, the, the view count is still going up. Do I think that Hunger Games was the catalyst for the explosion of Battle Royale genre? No, I think that Battle Royale was the catalyst for the explosion. I think that like Hunger Games has an excellent chance of being influenced by Battle Royale. If you haven't like read it or seen it, it's pretty great. Um, I like the comic. It It's way over the top violent uh i really like the movie the the first movie battle royale it's really good i've also read the uh the book um it's a cool premise but i don't want to get sidetracked too much i like it i don't think that concept is unique for squid games no but it's somewhat similar a bunch of contestants one winner people die some similarities there um, but it's good. It works really well in this superhero world. It really does. Let's see. Um, a comment here. Hey, Chris, glad to hear another person singing Battle Royale praises. It's really cool. Um, oh, that's what I just said. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. Oh, here's one more comment to go related to that same thing. I think the Hunger Games author claims she hasn't heard Red Battle Royale before she did her work. Look. No matter what, I wouldn't say that like anything specific is plagiarized or copied, but the broad idea has some similarities. So she can say whatever she wants. I still think that there's a chance she was influenced by it. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Running Man. Um, more the movie than the than the short story, I would say. But yeah, Running Man was like a, a, a good early example of that sort of, you know, like one contestant is going to survive. Um yeah, I could see some of that. Squid Game was good. good. 
Uh, I bet that's the same premise for Mr. Beast's videos. <laughs> Pretty, pretty soon, Mr. Beast will start killing his contestants. <laughs> Moving on to a um, couple other little reviews. I only have two other monthly comics that I picked up. Something is Killing the Children. I always dig this book, but this issue is not necessarily good jumping on point. Issue 26, we're right in the middle of an arc. All I can say is that um, this artist, Werther Deladera, this person is getting more and more confident with their storytelling each issue. I feel like um, more and more confident in their own style, and the storytelling reads very cleanly. Um, so, so I do admire that. Um, I think that this is a book that is still showing some evolution. I wouldn't recommend this as the jumping on point, but I do like this this horror book. Uh, monsters, in simplest terms, there's there's lots of monsters out there. Uh, I'm not familiar with that one, Zach. Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. I can only assume that's another one about, you know, one person winning and others dying. But I don't I don't know that one. Uh, last monthly book I'll take a look at is Batman Superman World's Finest. If for no other reason, I strongly recommend this book because of Dan Mora's artwork. Dan Mora... I wish I discovered sooner, but I'm having the pleasure now of going back and reading things like Once in Future. Um, maybe at some point I will dip my toe in the Power Rangers world just so that I can see more Dan Mora art. But uh, the artwork itself is plenty to recommend this title. Uh, in simplest terms, this storyline is about a new kid with superpowers called Boy Thunder, and both Superman and Batman are attempting to train him to be a hero using slightly different techniques. While all that's going on in the background, Joker is working for a villain called The Key. So there's a there's a bigger thing going on. We're not sure exactly what. But honestly, look, Mark Wade can write superhero stuff in his sleep just about, and it'll be pretty darn good. But the Dan Mora art, man, love it. You know what? Let me acknowledge this too. Um, Tent Ringer is uh, pointing out the colors. So we don't always acknowledge our letterers and colorists and stuff. So let's take a look. Uh, colors. Ah, Tamra Bon Villain. Bon Villain. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I think that that's a possibility. Let's see. Once in Future is pretty great. Looking forward to the next deluxe edition collection. The Lottery is from the 40s, about a small town doing a drawing to decide who becomes this human sacrifice to bring a good harvest. Well, in that case, that's not radically different than, say, the Wicker Man. Um, so that's everything I got from monthly, but also got like some back issues and some stuff. I, I love Ronan. Um, I've, I've got the trade paperback. Uh, this is actual book one in excellent, excellent condition. So I found that at a good price. Picked that up. This is back when Frank Miller was somebody that everybody got excited about. That may sound confusing to newer readers because because I know he's a little more hit and miss these days. But there was a time when Frank Miller could do no wrong. Um, here's my pick of the week, though. Berserk. Berserk 41 came out. Um, I almost get emotional about this because I love this story so damned much. And this is the last Tonkabon. This is the last volume that was like written and drawn with his assistance by um, Kentaro Miura before he passed away. Okay. Yes, Jim, they're very good. They're very good. <sighs> If you haven't read Berserk, it, it might not be for everyone because it is um it is very dark. There's always, by the way, like a fold out poster in in these uh, Tonkaban, which is kind of nice, fully colored. Berserk is very dark, and some like anything that you can think of that's horrible has basically happened to the main character guts. Okay, just about anything bad you can think of has happened to him. And he starts off the, the, the whole series a total asshole. Just just 
a big jerk. But as you start to understand what he's gone through, the fact that he's still going and still trying to do some good in this world is kind of amazing. By this point, this is pretty far into the series, obviously, um, 41 Tonkabons, and some of them are quite big. He now has a whole host of, I'll call them sidekicks, but, you know, teammates, and they've softened him a bit, and it's kind of beautiful in a, in a lot of ways. Um, and the artwork has evolved, and this story is just epic. I really can't get into it without just spoiling things. I don't want to spoil anything. There's moments of humor. This one definitely reveals a big twist, so I won't show the last couple pages. But um, if you've never read Berserk and you're okay with like a really dark action story, it's pretty fantastic. It really, really is. It really is. Did he draw himself to death? I don't think so. I don't think so. He took breaks and stuff. He just had a um, like a heart issue that was undiagnosed. Guts is the best edgy character because he grows out of it. That's that's a fair observation. That is. He does start intentionally like as edgy as possible, and you're almost like, well, this is over the top edge lord stuff. But it goes very interesting places. It really does. Um, it's it's one of my all-time favorite comics. It, it, it really is. I also picked up a few sort of graphic novels and trades that I haven't had a chance to read yet, but I'm excited to. I picked up Batman Noel by Lee Bermejo because I've heard it's a decent Christmassy type of um, comic, so I'm excited to read that. I picked up Kate Beaton's newish biography book, Ducks, Two Years in the Oil Sands. Uh, Kate Beaton's hilarious. I remember meeting her at some small press expo events in um, Bethesda, Maryland, like over a decade ago when she was doing humor comics. But she's created this huge, like over 400 page um, slice of life biography about her time when she was young working the oil sands up in Canada where she grew up. Excited to read that. I've been flying through Fist of the North Star, so every I, I picked up one of the new Tonka Bonds for me. And finally, um, I picked up this book, Hellbound. Um, how, hold on. How long did Miura work on Berserk for? Well, first of all, I do have an episode that goes into quite a bit of depth, and I'm honestly fairly proud of that episode. So I encourage you to go to Comic Tropes and watch the episode on Berserk. If I'm remembering right, it was somewhere around 86 that it started. Somewhere around 86, I think. That's hard to remember for sure. It, it could have been a little later than that. Do you think IDW is going to start to go into a downward spiral after it loses the Hasbro licenses? Probably not, honestly. Um, another big thing that they've got is Ninja Turtles. Ninja Turtles, don't underestimate how big that is. It's huge. And they've got a lot of um, new properties that are that are doing pretty well. They've got a lot of great um, creators working with them. So I'm not too worried about IDW right now. Hey, Jane, glad, glad you were able to uh, make it home. I know you had a long day of work. That's my sister down here. Thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, the Beowulf says, Kate Beaton is legitimate, incredible, and I'm bummed she doesn't do the humor stuff anymore. I hope she comes back to it too because she is hilarious. Harka Vagrant is a great book great uh let ducks beat out my mother recent dating book in canada last week. wanted to be mad but ducks is great okay okay sorry mom knitting knitting is evergreen though kate beaton i've heard that name before insert edgar Allan poe looking hard at the letter beam yes 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 she's great she's great so i wait to read hellbound i've only started to read this folks but let me tell you a couple things about it. First of all, it started as a um, South Korean webtoon, uh, manhwa. It's written by Yun Sang Ho. He has done animation as a director, but he's all, most famous, I would argue, for directing Train to Busan. Great zombie movie, as well as 
a sequel set in that world with different characters called The Peninsula. He created this idea, Hellbound, which is the Hellbound, which is about like an angel starts appearing in the world and telling people, you are going to be taken to hell and and they'll give, you know, like maybe like a few hours, a few days, or a few even a couple years but they'll like announce that these people are being taken to hell and sure enough these three huge like demons made of just muscle will just appear and smash the shit out of that person and take them to hell it's about a world like that uh it follows police investigating these murders and trying to make sense of this new world it follows some religious cults and then there's a time jump and it focuses on um, a family who's told they're like a young kid going to go to hell in a few years. Really interesting stuff. Really pretty artwork too by an artist named uh, Choi Gyu Sook. Uh, I think that, yeah, each person looks different. It's solid storytelling. Characters feel different from each other. Turns out this just became a live action Netflix series. Well, we all know live action South Korean shows on Netflix are huge. So let me uh, bring something up. We'll go into uh, the first piece of news that I have here. Andy, lovely to have you here. And was it adapted into a TV series? Funny you should mention that. Let's get into the first piece of news. Hellbound. Hellbound. Obviously, I just talked about some of these details. Uh, yes, this just debuted on Netflix on the 19th, two days ago. It instantly became the most popular show on the platform worldwide. Squid Game was still worldwide the most watched show they had. This has now displaced it. So, a lot of interest in it. Um, what else can I say? I don't know how many of you out there maybe watched Train to Busan, but I do recommend that movie. It's really cool. Let's see. I saw there was a Korean show on Netflix based on this and did not know the Busan connection. Wonder how good that adaptation is. Um, I don't think Train to Busan was a manga, if that's what you're saying. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean. Like, you know, I wish that the sticker wasn't there too in a way. Well, it actually isn't a sticker. Let me just be clear. This is actual like printing. I, I sort of get what you're saying, but you know what? That sells books. So that's just the publishing world. I second void, let my books be books. Um, agree, they always try to find other versions if I can. Yeah. I understand, guys. Um, you know what? You can find probably an early printing that does not have this, and that would probably make it a little bit of a fun source of trying to collect something. But I'm excited to try this show out because I've been reading this, uh, this comic. I think it's pretty cool. I'm excited to see where this goes. I am. So that was the first piece of news that I wanted to mention. Uh, Train to Busan is awesome. Aren't they making an American version now? I think you're right. I don't know who is responsible for making that, but I think you're right that they are making an adaptation. And you know what? Uh, sometimes that's okay. Because, for instance, if I went back and, and said, um, I, I remember I got a uh, bootleg DVD of Ringu from Japan. And then like a couple years later, or maybe it was only one year later from when I got it, the movie came out, the American version. And both of those were really good. So sometimes even though it's like a very similar story, you, you can still have a really solid adaptation. Um, no, Andrew, I did not have that news. He mentions that Donny Cates and Ryan Otley are leaving Hulk. I have to admit, I did not have that news. Um, hmm. I like both of those creators. I've there's a lot of stuff Donny Cates has done that I like. There's a lot of stuff Ryan has done that I like. 
I didn't really connect with their run on Hulk. So if they're moving on, I guess I'm kind of okay with that on a personal level. Um, I'm, I'm more excited to see what they would do next. Yeah. How mature is the manga? Is it super violent? If you're talking about the Hellbound, I would say it is not the most violent comic out there, really. Um, it's about as violent as maybe, say, Demon Slayer, so more like a teenage level. Although the themes are, 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 are deeper and more realistic. They're, they're, they're a little more grounded. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Otley, as of right now, is still the artist on the Hulk, just to be clear. Um, and it, his artwork, like, look, Otley is great when you give him, like, a bunch of apps. He can do slow pains and stuff, but his best work is when you can give him something big to draw, like something epic, because I don't think he was used very effectively on that Nick Spencer run of Amazing Spider-Man. That was just a little too slow for me. Um, I think I say um too much on this, don't I? Not only would I do a Frank Frazetta video, I have spoken to his granddaughter sarah forzetta a couple times and i would really like to maybe have her on the show to get some extra insight on frank so that is definitely something i would like to do i had the good fortune of going to the frazetta museum on his property he was alive, but the day i went he wasn't feeling well he did not come out but his wife was there, and I got to um, – there's that um again. I got to learn a lot of interesting stories about their lives together. Uh, I, admi I admire Frank a lot. He's a very cool artist. Me and Sarah follow each other on Link and – Link? Link and – I don't know that one. Oh, but since we're talking about social media real quick while I uh, – to start inking out and cleaning up this guts sketch that I uh, am working on. Obviously, Twitter is not doing great, and it will probably not go anywhere, but it has problems. So I have personally been looking into some of the other potential platforms uh, for social media, None of them are anywhere near the popularity and scale of Twitter right now, but I did go ahead and sign up on both Mastodon and The Hive. So I have a presence on both of those. The Hive especially seems to have a lot of comic book creators on it, so that's kind of cool right now. But it doesn't have two-factor authentication, and you know, it, both of them are sort of like just trying to catch up with moderation and stuff. What? Andrew Jefferson, I have to acknowledge this because of the super chat. He says, who would win in a fight, Jim Mahfoud or EJ Sue? First of all, those are two pretty chill guys that are much more likely to enjoy uh, a, a hamburger than a fight. <laughs> um, I, I can't imagine them fighting. So... Uh, You'd have to come up with a very specific premise there that would have them uh, at odds. That 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 one uh, steps a little. Uh, and you know what? I don't want to play favorites because I happen to like both those guys. Thanks for the challenging question, Andrew. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to uh, back off that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, you guys would probably get along great. I don't know if you've ever met <laughs> a burger fight. Well, you may, okay. I bet that they could each be convinced to have a food fight for charity or something. <laughs> Interesting question. But there's probably enough uh, fighting in the world that I'm glad that, I'll, honestly, a lot of comic book creators are pretty amazing at, at getting along well. It's an interesting world. And it's a smaller world than you think. Burger fight. I love that one. 
let me jump back to um I keep saying um I need like a co-host or something so that I'm not filling silence all the time. I uh, what I need is somebody that's just doing funny audio clips for me to react to or playing videos. Let's move on to another piece of news. Silk Spider Society. What is it? It will be a new live action Spider-Man show. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. I don't think any of us had that on our radar as an option, but Sony did. Sony owns all that uh all that Spider-Man stuff. So they're going to do a show. This is actually coming out of the deal that they made with Lord and Miller for the guys that are doing the Spider-Verse movies who are pretty awesome. It will, uh, there'll be producers on it. It's going to focus on the character from Marvel, Cindy Moon, known as Silk. It's going to air, it's a weird complex rights thing where it's going to air on both MGM Plus and then Amazon. But okay, we most of us probably have Amazon. Showrunner is Angela Kang. She has been running Walking Dead, or I should say an, one of the executive producers on Walking Dead for a while. She's got her bona fides in. And I don't know exactly what the TV show will be, but if I had to hazard a guess, Cindy Moon starts off her adventures searching for her parents. If you're not familiar with her origin, she was a character created by Dan Slott and Umberto Ramos, and lots of hands there. <laughs> she was bitten by the same spider as Peter Parker. She was a classmate of Peter Parker's. She got bit by that spider somebody that was looking out for people that are spider totems this guy ezekiel found her not peter locked her away in a vault and took took care of her but she was she grew up alone basically or, or with just ezekiel so she when she finally emerges in the modern day she she gets out and everything uh her first plan is to find her parents and, and you know let her let them know that she's alive and okay she has the same powers as spider-man except she can create organic webbing out of her fingers i didn't know mgm plus was a thing i'm not sure it is yet to be honest it might be a rebranding of another streaming service i i need to look into that a little bit more my gremlin is named after cindy moon sony is going to run the spider-man franchise into the ground probably eventually they will yeah they 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 have the rights to it they're going to try to get every dollar they can and uh that may end up in someday them not knowing what to do and the rights will revert to the the Disney Corporation, and we'll have a totally different corporation that can exploit it. It's kind of all the same, isn't it? But I like Cindy Moon. She's an interesting character. She's she's confident, but she also does have some social anxiety, which I think is a relatively new thing to acknowledge in the medical community. But that's very real and it makes sense that she would have that not having the same social experience growing up uh morbius cameo trust me i'm sure they're thinking about it i'm sure they're thinking about it they should do spider gwen maybe but i think that they're pretty confident using her in the animated spider verse movies for now anyway let's see disney owns everything they haven't told us about everything okay <laughs> uh oh void coupon says that it's gonna morb gonna morb paste pot pete cameo they don't own paste pot pete they don't own paste pot pete but if they did i'm available happy to be paste pot pete 
for any streaming service. <laughs> if I was Silk, I'd be so pissed that Peter got to be on the outside all the time. Yeah, I think that she probably is a little bit, to be honest. Although they, because they were bitten by the same spider, have this weird thing where they sort of unwillingly lust after one another. There's like, they, they, they each emit a hormone that the other finds difficult to resist. It's very animalistic. So they actually do their best to not spend too much time together. Paste Pot Pete, played by Sir Ian McKellen. Damn you, sir, that role is mine. I shan't let anyone take it away from me. <laughs> oh, there we go. Makoto has an idea for how Sony can make some money. Put Big Wheel in this show. Big Wheel, if you don't know, is a guy that drives a big wheel. You kind of get everything you need to know from his name. I wonder if Sony has a think tank dedicated to figuring out which Spider-Man characters they own to try and launch. I think that that would make the most sense, right? But then they're making a movie based on somebody like El Muerto. And I'm like, that is so obscure that almost like, why bother? I don't know. The Wall. I wonder if they own The Wall because that's from Spidey Super Stories. That would be an interesting wrinkle if... Sony owned the original characters from Spidey Super Stories because those were aimed at kids, not really set in the regular Marvel universe. Um, that would be funny. I wonder. Big Wheel, I need more Mind Worm. Um, hold on. Tari says, do you care about sports? I care about sports. If so, are you watching the World Cup? Don't really follow soccer, to be honest, or uh, football, as most of the world calls it. Uh, don't know a whole lot about that world. Not my thing. Tried, gone to a few games, just can't really get into it. Too too low scoring for me to, to get excited about. I know there's probably tons of football fans in the chat right now saying, like, you're insane, Chris. I get it. I know it's the most popular sport worldwide. Um, just can't quite get into it. Does Sony own the Punisher? Nope. Nope, they don't. Yeah, um, I think it's basically, you'd have to see a contract to see. They say that they own 900 characters. 900 characters that were created in the Spider-Man books. But I think um, some of those characters have spun off and become their own big properties, and those rights were always carved out. So it's not just that you debuted in a Spider-Man title. It's like, you know, you debuted in a Spider-Man title, and you stayed primarily a supporting character in Spider-Man books. For instance, I bet they own Puma. You know, Puma has never really had his own run or been an, a, a key member of the Avengers what do I think about Ryan Gosling as the sentry? Ryan Gosling's a great actor. If they cast him as that, sure, I could understand that working. We'll move on to another set of news. Another set of news. That's how people say it, right? I could be a, a news anchor. Uh, the Blade movie is moving forward. It was supposed to be filming this month originally. And at the last minute, basically, Marvel was like, let's hit the pause button, actually. I don't think that they were very confident about the vision of the director or the script that they had. It seems almost for sure that actor Mahershala Ali was not very excited about it. So they put the pause button on that one. And now they've announced that they've got a director, Yan Demange, I'm guessing. Uh, I know he's done a few movies. He's also directed Lovecraft Country, whatever that HBO show was. He directed the pilot, which went over very well. 
Oh, and that starred another uh, Marvel person, didn't it? That that starred uh, the dude who's playing Kang. Anyway, Michael Starbury has written for an Ava DuVernay show. Whatever it is, Mahershal Ali apparently got to have a say in who they were hiring. So he's on board. It's important to have the actor excited. Uh, filming is going to start early next year. They're still trying to hit their September 2024 goal. And the tone is said to be darker than the original script that they had and definitely action-based. So we're, we're definitely trying to replicate what worked in the original Wesley Snipes movies and ignore what didn't. We shall see. Mahershal Ali is awesome. You ever see him in that movie Moonlight? He's incredible. They're going to have to write a one-liner better than ice skating uphill if it's to be considered a success. <laughs> Agreed. Hopefully they don't add Blade's daughter to it. I wouldn't be surprised if she shows up at the end for, like, potential sequels. You gotta, gotta always think about the future with this, these franchise things. But no matter what, we always have the comics. Nobody has to like the movies. Will they use the original Blade design? Probably not. It's a little dated now. But they could go in a very different direction than what the movies did. Because the movies really weren't that close to what the comics were. You need more tax avoidance? I think that, uh, I think Wesley kind of filled that up for, for all of Hollywood. Did he have, I don't, did he have a green jacket? I think he had green goggles and, and a brown jacket. I'm pretty sure it was, a, it was green goggles, not a green jacket. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I'm just, not remembering right now. Let me, um, they need new designs to make new toys. Or why don't we just go with the original Blade uh, designs and just put a Mahershala Ali head on top of it? I don't know if any of you guys remember this. Kenner is a company that basically now they, they got absorbed by Hasbro at a certain point because they started to not do so well after they lost their. Star Wars license. When, once, once they couldn't make new Star Wars stuff in the 80s, they floundered quite a bit. One license they got was Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. That was a movie with Kevin Costner. I think it's a pretty fun movie. It's not great. The, the accents are very non-British, but it's a fairly fun movie. And Kenner got the rights to do the action figures but kenner was looking to save money wherever possible so they took bodies from star wars figures and just repainted them so that those big green pigs that are called gamorian guards in return of the jedi they took that and repainted it and that became friar tuck's body they took the ewok village playset and just called it Sherwood Forest playset. They just reissued toys that they already had. And they didn't like have very good scale or anything like that. And people were like, this isn't Sherwood Forest. This is where Wicked W. Warwick lives. <laughs> there we go. I had the Robin Hood Sherwood Forest toy, a.k.a. Star Wars Ewok Village. Yup. Yup. That had Alan Rickman chewing the scenery. Alan Rickman was great in that movie. He was a total blast. He was a total blast. But if you ever want <laughs> to look at some kind of funny toys, I recommend diving into the history of Kenner and especially looking at their toys for Robin Hood. It's pretty awesome. Bear with me. I'm just doing some fine detail here, and then I will jump back to the chat 
see what I am missing. Hey, hey, hey. Come on, Chris. Do a good job. Don't don't screw this character up. You love this character. All right. Was there a Brian Adams figure? No. No. He sang the hit song for uh, that movie. Eh, what was it? Do it for you. I can't remember exactly. It's too long ago. What a way to rub in the fat insult by making Friar Tuck out of an alien pig. <laughs> Imagine being that actor. That actor was a comedian that used to be on... Uh, Whose line is it anyway? A lot of times, the British one. I wonder if he ever did any stand up talking about, yeah, how there was an action figure made of him based on a fat alien pig. It's not very flattering. Uh, Steve, lovely to have you here. I know it's been a while since you got sucked in a comic, and I asked what comic world. So if you can get sucked into a manga world, what would it be? Oh, if I could get sucked into a manga world? Yeah, uh, I would get sucked into Bakuman, about people making comic books. That's what I, I would definitely love to be in that world. Everything I do, I do it for you. Is that the name of the actor that played Friar Tuck? It must be. Thanks, Tentbringer. Must be. Uh, Chris, what should I buy from the Fantagraphic sale? Ooh, fun question here. I already grabbed some vintage shoujo manga and Harvey Kurtzman EC, or so that's like the artist edition. Oh, Harvey Kurtzman's EC work. Yep. Anything else I should grab up? Yeah, man. Uh, Love and Rockets. This is its 40th anniversary year, I believe. I'm pretty sure this is 40 years. Love and Rockets is awesome. If you're looking, if there's a Fantagraphic sale and you're trying to wonder what to get, I definitely recommend that. I know Fantagraphics has done a lot of books by this great artist writer called Michael DeForge. Look those up. So those are two strong recommendations that I've got there. Oh, I think that Fantagraphics also does the reprints of the original Mickey Mouse comic strip and those are really good so those are all fan graphics books i strongly recommend how dare you but here's another good recommendation well let me well where did it go there yes my favorite thing is monsters really unique interesting book made my top 10 list the year that that came out uh grab that complete eight ball Anything Daniel Klaus, yeah. Anything Dan, Dan Klaus. I thought he said Bakugan. No, I said Bakuman. Bakuman. It's a good, good comic, yeah. Yeah, 40 years. I think that they've taken some breaks, but the characters age in real time. Monster Ed Pescor's Artist Edition, if it's still in print. That's a good recommendation, too. Yeah, right on. I grabbed that eight ball, been burning through it all week. Well, there you go, folks. Apparently, we all should be checking out the Fantagraphics sale. That's a place local to me. They've got a very small store and like a wall that they call an art gallery. It's pretty cool. Maybe someday I'll uh, make a little video of it. It's really cool. Uh, Steve Sorensen recommends from Fantagraphics, Don Rosa's Scrooge McDuck, Monster, and Eternaut. Oh, was, was Eternaut by Fantagraphics? I totally forgot that they published that one. But if so, yeah, Eternaut is great. A video there. Uh, so back. Uh, sure. Uh, it would probably be a pretty small one. Oh, and I have something wrong. Uh, Drawn in Quarterly publishes to Forge. I saw your post about him on Twitter, and just before that, I thought if you had any opinions about him and if you'd be interested in doing a video about him. Maybe. Maybe. Man, when I knew him, he was just a kid. Like, he was something like 15 or something. But um, he's gone on to have 
a great career. So I'm really, I guess I can't quite say proud of him, but, but that's what I feel like just because I've known him for so long. I knew him when he was very young. You know, the Fantagraphics store must carry some of the drawn and quarterly stuff because I, I think I got confused because I'm positive I've bought some of the Forges comics from that Fantagraphics store. So they must carry a few um, other new things. They must because I'm positive I bought it there. Ever thought of doing an episode on Greg Capullo? Yeah, I've definitely considered it. Yep. Love and Rockets documentary? What? Where? What's it called? There probably is a documentary since it's been around for so long. I know I did an episode very early when I had comic tropes. I don't know if I did a good job on it, but because I honestly don't remember now. I mean, that stuff was like now five, six years ago. It's hard to remember because I, I do something every week. By the way, I get like the new episode up yesterday morning. I'm still editing it, uh, but I think I can finish editing the new episode tonight. If not tonight, definitely. Tonight. So I will, um, I will definitely have a new comic tropes for you folks pretty darn soon. And I think it's a really cool one that a lot of people should find interesting. I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's been harder to edit the last couple of weeks because unfortunately I've had a few um, pretty intense pains that I'm working through. I tore my rotator cuff on this shoulder, on my left shoulder. I'm going to physical therapy for that. I can still use it mostly and stuff, but sometimes I do things that hurt it quite a bit. Because I've got the rotator uh, cuff thing, I've been sleeping a little awkwardly in bed. And that's led to a severe knot in my back on my right shoulder. That's causing me a lot of pain. And then sometimes I, I end up with like this weird thing where my left knee goes out of joint a little bit. And I've got, I'm dealing with that right now. So I'm not trying to complain, but it's, it's literally painful for me to sit at the desk for more than say two hours. It's quite painful. And I haven't been able to, it, it, it takes a long time to edit comic tropes, a long time. So it's been tough. Uh, I'll get better. I, I, these things are being worked out. You know, the knot in my back, I, once I can get my rotator cuff here healed, I can sort of like reach over and, and massage it out, I think. But right now I can't really reach it. We've got more news, though. Oh, hold on. Wally says, Chris, there was a Hernandez documentary in the past month or so by PBS, K-Set. Uh, it's really for people who aren't familiar about the series. Well, that, that's cool. That's uh, The more people know about the Hernandez brothers, the better. I remember getting to um, meet them at, uh, again, SPX. So it, people have asked before, like, what are some of my favorite conventions? And I always say SPX, Small Press Expo, because I met so many interesting people there. I met Harvey Picard. I met, you know, Kate Beaton. I met uh, Charles Burns. I met Frank Miller, Paul Pope, the Hernandez brothers, Jaime and Gilbert. You get to meet them because SPX is a way more intimate convention than most. It's not huge. So you will, oh, um, who's the guy, uh, the, the, the former senator that wrote uh march all of a sudden i'm blanking on his name because i'm terrible at names but i got to meet him spx folks i can't recommend it strongly enough it is a fantastic fantastic convention if you're ever curious you'll edit my videos well the the the, the time consuming thing isn't even necessarily the editing tommy it's getting all the different images Editing a, a video about still images takes way longer than a video if I was reviewing, say, a movie, because I could insert some movie clips and stuff like that. But when you're doing a comic book, you have to get a lot of scans. 
or get digital copies and download them. And then you have to add sort of movement and transitions. So that's what takes so long is getting all those images. That takes a lot of time for every episode. And then you put it in the document and then you always want to add some sort of movement here and there, not too much because then it's like too chaotic, but you have to have transitions. You have to have like a little bit of movement, you know, a zoom or a pan here and there. Otherwise it looks very stagnant. So yeah, John Lewis, thank you everybody. Um, got, to, got to meet John Lewis. So anyway. Uh, thank you, Jack. Nice of you to say. Nice of you to say. It was taking me a minute too, Caveman. I'm, I'm terrible at names. I'm terrible at names. So anyway, just um, a great convention that I just uh, thought I'd mention here. You can often meet creators at all sorts of levels of conventions and have an interesting conversation. But I guess the difference is, say I went to something like New York Comic Con. Um, I'll, I'll give you a specific example. Jim was there, Jim Mafood. And I uh, saw him and said hello. And that was literally about it there, just because there were people interested in buying his books. And I feel like so guilty if I'm just standing there having a conversation and preventing somebody from getting a sale. And yes, people are buying the books at SPX as well. But because there's less people, there's there's more intimacy and there's more downtime. And you really get to talk to everybody. It's really, really wonderful. I'd still love to go to one of the Tokyo Comic Cons just to see what it's like. Um, yeah, Ed Piscor and Jeff Darrow are both there moving around. Uh, I'm jealous. I love Japan. I would love to be there right now. I'd love to be hunting for my white whale of a comic, which is in 1975, Japan made an adaptation of the new movie, then Jaws. I love the movie Jaws. I have never been able to find a physical copy, and I've got myself on all these sort of mailing lists for J Japanese book and comic book stores, and I still haven't found it. But whenever I go there, that's what I look for. And I know someday I'll be able to find it. Um, what comic creators have you been starstruck by live besides Larry Hama? Well, that's fair. Yeah, I was <laughs> pretty uh, starstruck uh, speaking to Larry because that was one of the guys I grew up with. Other people that I had that same feeling with, um, not not everybody, to be honest. Um, some of them, hmm, who else have I been starstruck by? Well, I've got an interview on here where I, I spoke with Stan Lee. That's a pretty huge name. And um, and, and there was some weight of it there. You know, I, I didn't want to irritate him. I wanted to try to ask some things that he hadn't been asked before so that it was still an interesting interview. Uh, I was a little starstruck by that one. And then I used to have a podcast where I would talk about genre TV shows with my co-hosts. And I would do interviews with a lot of actors and writers and people like that that made the shows. And sometimes I did those in person, rarely, but sometimes. So that was a little nerve wracking, no matter what level they're at. Like, for instance... I, I've interviewed people like, say, Sam Witwer from Budgood. If you're a, if you're sort of a, a, a genre nerd, you might know which actors I'm talking about there. Both of those, just a little more nerve-wracking in person because they've got a publicist that's, you know, handing them off to you. There's, there's a lot more people in the middle, and you don't want to mess up, but you also don't want to be boring. You don't want to be boring. you got to ask something a little challenging. What is your favorite place to read comics outside of your house? Hmm. It's funny. I guess I hadn't really ever thought of that because I definitely do read my comics primarily at home. Um, where else do I read my comics that I enjoy? I've taken some comics or especially honestly digital 
versions of comics when I say go on a hike and have a picnic. I've done that, but mostly I do read them at home. Yeah, I can't think of really anywhere else that I really read comics. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not 100 sure what that one means. Kenobi. Hold on. Always love acknowledging something like this. I've got more news too. I've got some big news that I gotta get I gotta get going. Max Power says, would you join an experimental procedure where you'd be put on ice until your shoulder could be healed, but a bald German man would be pining for you? Pining for me? I don't know. I don't think I'd want to do anything where I'd be put on ice. I don't I don't think I'd want to do that. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting idea. Let's go back to news. This is what I have in the title. There was an accusation by a Brazilian, I'll call her a cartoonist because she makes comics, um, Mary Cagnon. And she says... And again, I am trusting Google Translate on some of this, but she said that she was, she found out, this is what she said the other day, this day I found out that the 1899 series, that's a show on Netflix, is just identical, that's her words, to my comic Black Silence published in 2016. And here we've got a pair of images. We've got a black pyramid, which is a, an important uh, element in her short sci-fi story, Black Silence. And we've got a black pyramid from 1899. And we also have another image here where we've got the, the cast of the show and they have an inverted black pyramid in their eyes. And here's Mary's comic, Black Silence, uh, that also has people with a pyramid being reflected in their iris. And she says some, something here. She goes, it's all there. The Black Pyramid, the deaths inside the ship, the multinational crew, the apparently strange and unexplained things, the symbols in the eyes and when they appear. And she listed a few other things. It's freezing up. I don't... Yeah, I'm showing I have good... Uh, I'm sorry to hear that, Jeannie and uh, Tid Goblin. I am showing I have good stream health, unfortunately. So I there's nothing I can really do to address it. I, I just don't have anybody else to, to look at these things. Um, so I'll just slow it down. Um, the translation is correct. Okay. So that's a serious accusation. So I just wanted to address it. And I want to make it clear i personally have not had time since reading this yesterday to watch all of 1899 or to read black silence uh taking a close look at at, at it from what i can see i think that it's more superficial i also wonder if mary was told these things and shown some images of her work and the show or I don't know if she's actually watched 1899. Now, if she has, and she thinks that it's plagiarism, I think that she should, you know, initiate a lawsuit. That, that's what they're there for. I'm not convinced that there is plagiarism here for, a, for a kind of a bunch of reasons. And I'll try to keep my comments brief because there is somebody else that went into this in more detail. And that is the website called uh, The Culture Cave. And I'm, I'm, I'm trusting the information that he gave to a large extent. But Mary said that she showed her book Black Silence at a European convention in 2017. Well, uh, 1899 is by the same European filmmakers that made the uh, hit show on Netflix dark. So it is theoretically possible that that comic could have gotten put in front of them before they did their show. It's theoretically possible. This channel, The Culture Cave, has read the full comic book and watched the full show. 
he comes to the conclusion that it features some surface level visuals but that the plot, the characters, and the setting itself are all very, very different. He does not think that there's really a good case for it. And I'm sort of trusting his analysis because of what he goes into there. Um, Black Silence is a short sci-fi story. It's set in the future. Some scientists are going to another planet. They're trying to see if humanity could survive there. They come across a black pyramid. It basically causes them to go crazy and to kill themselves. 1899 is set in the year 1899 on a steamship taking European immigrants from London to New York. They have visions of like a black pyramid. They feel like people are calling to them and, and one or two people at least jump off the ship and kill themselves or unalive themselves, I should say. I, I, sorry, you two. So it sounds like it's some surface level stuff. I I don't know that it. it mm. Let's see. K Bar says sounds like one of the art crew read the book and just copied visual framing they liked. Maybe. I would say first of all, are pyramids something you can claim? You know, is yours because I think that there's a lot of sci-fi stories we could go into that have pyramids there's a lot of different cultures that have pyramids you know we could find a doctor who episode like the pyramids of mars and say that it came from that um i don't know you know if she has a case i don't want to diminish it i don't um but these filmmakers did turn down the opportunity i'm pretty sure to do more of dark like they didn't want to exploit even their own work very much so the idea of sort of then going and ripping off somebody else's seems slightly less likely is all i'll say less likely it sounds like a kimba situation i there's a case though that disney knew what they were doing with uh the that um the black pyramids from yodorowsky and mobius is the inkle exactly um Pyramids of Mars is a great fourth Doctor story. It is. It is. It just like when I said pyramid, all of a sudden I remembered a good Doctor Who story all of a sudden. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it either, but I do have several friends that have told me that I really need to watch Dark, that it's really good. I've heard that both Black Silence, the comic, and 1899 are good, but, you know, some of the things I'm going to jump back to like a couple of her things that she said, Mary said. Um, the deaths inside the ship, unless like, unless we're talking very explicitly the same sort of thing, I'm not sure. A multinational crew, you know, find a sci-fi story that doesn't have a multinational crew on a ship. Uh, and if a steamship is going from London to New York, it's also going to have a multinational crew. I don't think that that's a ripoff idea. Um, this one is sort of too vague for me the strange and unexplained things but this one is valid the symbols in the eyes yeah that is pretty similar isn't it well apparently like these symbols literally appear in people's eyes in the comic when they go crazy this was mostly for promotional materials and it's just sort of when they wake up sometimes we see this in people's eyes because they're just sort of remembering their vision their dream and then it goes away i'm not sure that that's really the, the same it, it is similar though it is similar that look the pyramids and the eyes are definitely visual similarities but the there's no like main character that goes through the same things the very different settings i'm just not convinced i'm not convinced but it is a big enough accusation that I thought it was worth mentioning in the news, because if there's a case there, plagiarism is pretty serious. Plagiarism is pretty serious. So I thought I'd mention it. Um, let's see. I read Black Science and despised it. Ooh, that's, that's too bad. But I can see why it's well liked generally. OK. OK. Anyway. A big, whenever there's a big accusation of like like that of plagiarism in comics, it, it's kind of like, yeah, got to acknowledge it at least. Got to acknowledge it uh, um, in the news. I have other news that is not quite so incendiary. 
and one actually that is also fairly big deal. The next piece of news tonight, everybody get ready. The gimmick. I just thought that this sounded fun. So I wanted to talk about a comic that's coming up soon. This is by writer Joanne Starrer and artist Elena Gogo. I'm guessing, honestly, at the pronunciations. I'm terrible with that. Uh, it's published by um, an outfit called Ahoy Comics. But I like the premise here. It's about a pro wrestler with super strength. He accidentally kills an opponent in the ring, so he flees. He goes to Tijuana to reinvent himself. And I guess he just, he's got good skills, but he doesn't have a gimmick. That's, you know, the, the, the personality and then the delivery and everything that a wrestler comes up with. So he doesn't really have that yet. That's what he's fighting with. The writer here, Joanne, she actually owned and operated a women's wrestling promotion out of Pennsylvania back in 2002. So she probably does have some pretty great stories from behind the scenes of pro wrestling that are going to feed into a comic like this. Uh, and she's worked as an editor at all, all sorts of different publishers. She worked on like Marvel Knights as one example. She's been an image and all sorts of places. And uh, right, these days she writes comics along with um, Carrie Randolph on Glass Eye Studios. That's something that's available on Substack. They have a lot of free stuff too that they make available. Is it too easy to say Kane? I don't know. Jake Roberts. Yes. Anyway, I don't know. It sounded like an interesting comic. I can't talk about every single comic that has a press release or has an upcoming description, but this one sounded unique enough that I wanted to uh, call it out. I, I, it sounded fun to me, so we'll see. We'll see. Let's see. Once I took a tour of a big library in Brooklyn where they had comics in one of their sections. Is it common to find comics in public libraries in the U.S.? Greetings from Mexico City. Uh, I think it's absolutely common to find comics in our libraries. The smaller ones will generally have more graphic novels and trade paperbacks. The larger ones might even have floppies and will definitely have a deeper selection going into more indie stuff. But yeah, it's definitely like, I can't think of a library I've been into that does not have comic books. Steve, Ahoy Comics is based in Syracuse, New York. Oh, I didn't know that. All right, right on. So kind of local for you, huh? Isn't that somewhere where you are? The gimmick needs to join Marvel's Unlimited Class Wrestling Federation. Yes. The thing was briefly in there. The gimmick does sound good. Well, good. I'm glad I uh, mentioned it. Let's see. Comics and libraries have definitely exploded in collection size over the last decade or two. You know what else? I mentioned this, I think, two weeks ago, I'm pretty sure, in the news. Uh, there's something called Library Pass here where you can get books digitally. You don't even have to go to the library. You can just sign up with your local library. They have a comic book app through library pass you can read a bunch of comics a lot of publishers are in there including image and i'm pretty sure dark horse so uh, i think it is called comics plus it's an app so first sign up with library pass then get the comics plus app and you can read a ton of comic books free legally and your taxes are going to support it so everybody wins it's really nice my library has JLA Avengers, which is wild. That is. That is. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Currently going through the Berserk Deluxe Editions from my local library. Fantastic. See? So, yeah, like, uh, local libraries are awesome. They really are. I think the librarians have leeway on what they want to focus on. So some libraries will have better comic collections than others. 100% true. Yes, they, they, they often get a bunch of um, stuff that they think will work for their community. And that's just dope. What else do we have for news, you might ask? You might ask that. Guess what? I have the answer. 
uh, tried to sign up for Comics Plus, but they did not accept the name of my local library. Oh, that stinks. It's still new. I bet that it grows. I bet that it becomes better. I bet it becomes better. My library was where I caught up on One Piece. Wow, that's a lot of reading. I remember going to a school library with Death of Superman. There you go. That's awesome. Let's see. I got to check out library set up in the UK. See what we offer. Yeah, you do. Folks, free comics? Like, that sounds great to me. Either digital or print. Yeah. And then go to library sales, book sales. Because guess what? They don't care as much about having a first edition print. If it gets a little worn, they're going to sell that thing for pennies and just get a new copy. So you can get some great comics and books at library book sales. This is interesting. People joining in here. My old high school had Batman Year One. That's a great book. <coughs> My local library had Batman Chronicles Volume One. I liked it so much I decided to get it off eBay. That's a good story for getting into comics. I like that. Uh, whoops, that's not the one I meant to click on. Hold on. My library comics are in the below 18 section. They misread my ID at the time and asked me to leave. Now I am for sure not allowed in. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> it's been a whole year since I went to my library. I read up all their books on animations and the history of animation. Very cool. Very cool. Anyway, that, that led to a good discussion. I like it. I have more news, folks. Did you think that we were done? Let's talk about some mainstream stuff. We'll talk about the dawn of DC. That's DC Comics' new event that they're promoting. That is going to be apparently a one-year-long initiative starting in January after they wrap up their current event stories like Lazarus Planet. Uh, publisher Jim Lee said that it's supposed to be generally brighter uh, so a little more positive a little a little more adventure action focused i guess that sounds good um it all begins in january with action comics number 1051 they're going to also launch a lot of new titles at this point some of those include things like doom patrol Superboy, Batman the Brave and the Bold, glad to see that one coming back personally, Shazam, The Penguin, interesting, uh, Steelworks, that'll follow Steel and his daughter, so John Henry Irons and his daughter. Could be good. DC has OD on reboots way too much. This isn't a reboot, uh, fortunately, <laughs> just, uh, just an initiative to try to sort of be positive and try out a few new books. Let's see, K-Bar says, pretty excited for Dawn of DC. I got past worrying about what's still canon, what is not, and started enjoying DC, Ooh, DC again a lot more. All right, right on. Right on. And then I have something somewhat related to this. Let's see. Is it me or does the promo image seem kind of dark for a brighter initiative called Dawn of DC? Fair, very fair observation, very fair observation. You're right. Uh, Sounds like the guy putting together the PowerPoint at DC, not me. Uh, and Jim Lee didn't didn't necessarily have a huddle there to get on the same page, so to speak. But we've got a new Shazam title, and by the way, yeah, it's like uh, Chem Dog says, Wade Mora on Shazam. What was I just talking up? Wade Mora on world's finest so the idea of them on shazam i'm in I'm, I'm 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 interested but i want to talk about about shazam a little bit more they're going to have the actors from the shazam fury of the gods movie write their characters in an anthology book gimmicky but could be fun it'll be interesting i think at least to see who can do it and who can't maybe uh the book is going to be called shazam fury of the gods special Shazamily matters. They went for a pun. 96 pages, and it's going to be written, like I say, by the actors that play the uh, Marvel family. Zach Levy, Adam Brody, Ross Butler, DJ Katrana, Grace Carolyn Curry, and Faith Herman. 
I just copied their names I, I, from the news uh, briefs. I, I don't know. But it could be fun. Um, let's see. I like this comment. Hold on. Does a Penguin comic book mean that Danny DeVito will be writing another issue? I don't know. Did he? Did he, he did write one, didn't he? I don't know how that went. I did not read it. That would be interesting to know. But they've got Paul Dano writing a comic right now, and I think it's pretty darn good. Uh, they've got Bruce Campbell writing Sergeant Rock, and I think that's pretty darn good. So who knows? Maybe it'll work. I don't want the, these actors to take away comic book writers' jobs the same way that they took away voice actor jobs. But if it's a gimmick, whatever, it could be all right. Could be, could be. <laughs> Written by actors. Tech War. Yes. Yes, of course. William Shatner's novels, TV show, and comics where he created the idea and then sort of had some people ghostwrite the stuff. But everybody loves William Shatner, so we can forgive him for something like that. I don't know this person. I wish Simon Hanselman wrote and drew the Batman title. I don't know who that is. Uh, boy, this is reacting a little slow. The DeVito Penguin story was awful. I guess I'm glad I skipped it. Danny DeVito Penguin solved COVID and Catwoman hooked up with him. It was weird. <laughs> I'll be honest. Now it has my attention. How bad could that be if he's going like, lunch time, time to solve COVID and hook up with Catwoman. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see. That, that makes me interested. <laughs> I probably shouldn't be, but that actually makes me interested. You know what i'm gonna try to do some like faster inking on this because i'm thinking that like that's what serves guts like he deserves a lot of black and a lot of energy so let me do some faster inks than i was doing we'll see if that helps at all probably not i'm still the same artist but it can't hurt necessarily it's all learning exercise All learning exercise. All right. Well, I'm curious about that now, the Danny DeVito Penguin book. But I'm also curious to show you folks some more comic book news. Here's a book I think also sounds interesting. Uh, Free Comic Book Day is apparently going to have a Stan Lee book. I am Stan, a, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee by Tom Scioli. Well, Tom previously did a book about Jack Kirby back in 2020, and I thought that was actually pretty darn good. So I would like to read that, I think. Uh, we've read Stanley books, but a Stanley uh, biographical comic book sounds like a really kind of a no-brainer idea. Uh, Ten Speed Press is publishing that. And the last time she only did a this Jack Kirby book, there was a free comic book day version. So like, you know, that late April, early May. And then the book itself came out in September. So maybe we could expect a similar sort of time frame. Thought it sounded like an interesting idea to tell that as a comic. Steve, thank you for, for the super chat. That's really helpful. Um, what Marvel DC mainline book would you want to do? Um, not something I've like sat around giving a whole lot of thought, but uh, I think that I could probably do a good Spider-Man story, maybe Doctor Strange. I kind of tend to know Marvel a little bit better than I know DC, but I would love to take a more obscure DC character, like, I don't know, Metamorpho or something, and, and do, do something cool and unique with them. Yeah, that would, that would definitely be a blast. 
So, uh, DC, if you're hurting, feel free to reach out. I'd, I'd be happy to, to do something. <laughs> Let's see. I'm interested in Stanley's sudden image change. Did he have a sudden image change? I don't know. I didn't expect this. I hope it's as good as the Kirby one. The Kirby one was really good, right, Bat? It was. Would your Spider-Man story have pictures? Pictures of Spider-Man? Oh, I know what I should do. I should do a Pace Pop Pete book. I swear to God, I'm not kidding. Let me do a one-shot, Marvel. Let me do a one-shot about Pace Pop Pete talking about him as a real person trying to, like, hold down a real job and why, because of who he is, that just doesn't work. And he has to go back to being Pace Pop Pete and why he thinks Pace Pop Pete is a good idea for a name. <laughs> I, I Let me do it, Marvel. Come on. I know you all watch my show every week. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to let it go. I'm going to just keep harping on Pace Pop Pete until somehow, some way, I end up either writing a Pace Pot Pete book or I get to appear in at least a fan film as Pace Pot Pete. That's that's the goal here. That's the driving impetus. I'm I'm not gonna lay off. I'm gonna keep talking about Pace Pot Pete every once in a while until uh until something like that happens. What do you folks think? Good idea, bad idea? Stupid idea. <laughs> I'm going to just keep doing it. Is Pete his real name? Yeah. Yeah. Sold? All right, Andy, I want you to exploit all your connections. Don't cash them in on yourself. I want you to cash them in for me. <laughs> uh, let's see. How about writing a Pace Pop Pete versus Dynamite Thor where Pace Pop Pete glues the dynamite to Dynamite Thor's hand? Uh-oh. Well, he's invulnerable, I think, to his own dynamite. I'm pretty sure that was his only power. I think he was invulnerable to it. Because I remember he threw down dynamite to fly. He just blast across the ocean, remember? Yeah, hashtag, we want Pace Pop Pete. <laughs> I, I don't think I have enough people to get that trending, but you never know. You never know. Uh, Stan Lee used to be bald, then he got hair later in his life. That I know that. Yep, I know that. Tom is doing more YouTube lately. I'm kind of happy about it. Good, good. Would Dynamite Thor be weak to someone else's dynamite? I think just dynamite in general he's immune to. Because if he's not, that's just too bit. Too, it doesn't make sense. Your audio seems poor. Thank you. Uh, we'll see what I can do in the future. I'll, uh, I'll try to work on it um, in between episodes and see if I can make any improvements. Uh, I've got a few more news items that might be of interest to all of you and the people that watch this once it gets archived. Appreciate you folks watching too. It means a lot to me. Two more pieces of news. Here's a small one um, because I can't claim that I know a whole lot about this gentleman, but one of the co-founders of San Diego Comic-Con passed away. There was somewhere between, like, depending on different articles that you read, between like five to eight San Diego based comic book aficionados that put together the San Diego Comic Con. One of them was a gentleman named Greg Bear. Um, he did do some illustration, he did a lot of novels. He's written, you know, a Star Wars book, he wrote something in the Star Trek universe, he's written a bunch of different novels, sci fi novels, and stuff like that. Um, the first San Diego Comic-Con, by the way, folks, held back in 1970 in the U.S. Grant Hotel. They actually did two that year. One was sort of like a test run, and they only had maybe 50 to 60 people. And then they did one a few months later in the year that had more like 300 people. But that definitely grew. July 2015 had the highest recorded attendance with over 167,000 attendees. That's pretty impressive. New York. We're, we're talking more like 250,000 or something like that, but the, San Diego is still humongous. Whoops, what did I just do? There we go. Um, anyway, uh, let's give him a moment of remembrance because I'm sure that we all have gotten uh, news or entertainment out of San Diego Comic-Con. 
at one point or another. And, you know, thanks for creating something like that, that, that has endured and lasted so long. Um, to say nothing of the books, but I, I haven't read those, so I, I can't quite speak to them the same way. If any of you have, maybe you have something to add, but otherwise, I'm going to move on. Moveon.org. That's a shame. Yep. 71 is too young. Totally true. We know Pace Pop Pete is a bad guy, but is he really a bad guy? I'd say no. What is my favorite aspect of conventions? Personally, it's getting to connect with uh, like-minded people. Sometimes that is the pros, getting a little insight or just saying, like, telling them that I appreciate what they've given me. And sometimes it's talking to fellow readers and fans like myself. But that's probably my favorite personal aspect, Gene. Good question. Other things that I really enjoy are just the spectacle of it. Sometimes, like at the big ones, it's stuff like cosplay. At the smaller ones, it's more like the intimacy and getting to be wowed by the passion of, of what's being created, even if it's on a small scale. And just the variety of stories. Oh, interesting. Thank you for sharing. Uh, William Reeves, uh, Greg Bear was a fantastic writer. I love blood music, Darwin's Radio, Eon were all epic and fantastic ideas. Well, great. That's really nice to hear. Let's be honest, it's sexy cosplay. I kind of like all the cosplay. I don't like it all. Let me move on to the last piece of news I had today. And I found this super interesting. This is <laughs> This is crazy. Mike Hawthorne, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with him. Cool illustrator. He's definitely worked on books you've probably read. You know, with stuff like Spider-Man, Batman, Deadpool. He's worked on bit, plenty of big characters for the big two. Plenty. He shared a royalty check. Didn't put the name on it or anything. Wasn't calling people out. But look at this tweet. He's saying, I'm not trying to spill any tea. But this is why many comic artists die poor and cynical. What does it show? It's a royalty statement. This royalty statement is for a book that's over 10 years old, first of all. He explained that in a further tweet. And it shows that the uh, net revenue uh, was about $7,500. Pretty nice for, for an over 10-year-old book that, like, this company pulled that kind of money in. And... Then it shows what he made out of it, which is a dollar and forty-four cents. Out of seven thousand five hundred dollars for a book he drew, he got paid a dollar and forty-four cents. A lot of the industry news sites have said because of the formatting and stuff and context clues, like him saying that it was over ten years old and not for one of the big two, it wasn't Marvel and DC. A lot of them say that it's an Oni royalty check. I can't confirm that though. I'm not trying to spread gossip. But a lot of people seemed confident that that was theirs. Um, there also, though, is a deduction here, just to be fair. It shows that, like, you know, they would have paid him a higher amount, but they took back a, an advance that they had paid him over 10 years ago. You're telling me that over 10 years, that didn't pay for itself somehow? This book that, like, 10 years later is still pulling in a nice $7,500 for the company? And that out of that, the artist only gets a dollar and 44 cents. Look, I'm not saying that he deserves $7,000 of the $7,500, but a dollar and 44 cents? That's crazy. Andy says, Mike is the man most luscious head of hair in comics. <laughs> All right, uh, we've got a hairline king. Look at that. That's absolutely horrible. Oof, criminal. Wow, right? Look. I think it was on this show that like a week ago, I said sharing salaries and, and how much you make in a job is something that like nobody's really comfortable with. 
And I get it because it could theoretically be embarrassing to either to you or to someone that you care about that does similar work. But who really benefits when you hide that stuff? It's the employer. The less people know about what each other is making, the more the employer has the opportunity to like do something like this to somebody and not hear anything. 10 years, that's basically a blip. We got to make sure this kind of stuff doesn't happen. Shaking my head. Take some real balls to pull something like that. It just seems crazy to me that that's what even if it's like work for hire or something like a dollar and 44 cents out of 7,400, I didn't even do the math. Let me try to do, figure out what percentage that is real quick. I, I, let me see if I can do the math correctly here. I'm going to use a calculator. Um, 10.44 divided by 7,500. That means that you're making 10, you're making like basically two ten thousandth of a cent or two, no, two ten thousandth of a percent on every dollar. Two ten thousandth of a, of a cent per dollar that the company gets. What? Hope Mike didn't burn too many bridges by sharing this. I don't think so. I think that like uh, he's getting overall... I think, let, let's see, I was looking at the replies because I was very interested in that. This was on Twitter for what it's worth. Um, and a lot of industry pros have his back saying, that just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. And it just, the math doesn't seem right. You know, the, the deductions that they take and the percent they're giving you just doesn't seem right. There were a few fans that are always going to be this way saying like, well, you should know that going in. A company's always going to look out for itself. And, you know, you should just be grateful to have work. I, I don't subscribe to that same sort of thinking. It seems fair. Yeah. <laughs> That's robbery. If bridges were burned, it was worth it. That's just terrible to hear. I think you got to share stuff like this because I don't know. Like, he's got a great argument there of, like, how is it even worth it, you know? How is it worth it to make somebody else wealthy? And you'd be like, well, you got the recognition. Cool. Does that pay rent? Because obviously, you know, a few publishers or editors are going to get paid out of that. And they're going to be able to pay their rent. What the artist can't. It's crazy. It, it, it's crazy. So I, I don't really get it. Um, doesn't sound right to me. Doesn't sound fair. And that was the last real piece of news that I had to share, but I did want to share it because let's be honest about where American comics are sometimes. And I don't know. Uh, I, I love, I love comics. It's my favorite storytelling medium. I think it's so exciting and versatile. You know, I love crime comics and sci-fi and superheroes, and romance and autobiography. I love these things. But I don't necessarily love how exploitative it can feel sometimes. And it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. Andy, I really appreciate you having two cents on this. If more artists shared this kind of info, it would go a long way to keeping companies from doing this type of thing. I think that there is an element of that. Are, you, are we going to shame a company? Well, a company doesn't necessarily have feelings. So we're probably not going to shame them. But you share stuff like that. And I think more artists and writers and letterers and colorists are, are maybe a little more likely to stick up for themselves. Because they're like, oh, it's not just happening to me, you know? Um, and if I speak up, it gets normalized a little bit more. Yeah, working for exposure at a professional level. Crazy. I've heard this one before, yeah. Boss shows up in his new Lamborghini and the employee admires it. Boss says, well, work hard, make sacrifices, and next year, 
can buy another one. It's too true. Hey, how similar is it, honestly, though, to what happened last week with Elon Musk sending that poorly conceived letter to his Twitter employees that said, from now on, you know, I expect everyone to work hardcore and be dedicated to creating like Twitter 2.0. That's fine. But show them what their stake in it is. You know, tell them, I want to have like Twitter 2.0. And if we can hit these goals, you're going to get a bonus. You're going to, you're going to like get a promotion. Tell them about what's in it for them. Because all people see when you just send out a letter saying, I expect you to work hardcore is I expect you to sacrifice your work-life balance. You know, you don't need to be there for your family, blah, blah, blah. I had $44 billion to spend on something that doesn't really matter to me whether it works or not. Like I, you know, it, it's just so crazy to me how unsympathetic people in positions of power can be to, to, to the actual people that make things happen. There's a movie that came out about two weeks ago that I thought was really funny and timely. It's called Triangle of Sadness. And it's about the super wealthy, very few people on a, a really high-end luxury cruise. The, the boat goes down and a few people survive and are on what they assume is a deserted island. The only person that knows how to catch a fish, how to cook it, and how to make a fire, things like that, basic survival skills, happens to be a person who was the um, person in charge of cleaning the toilets. And all of a sudden, she is in charge. And these people that are used to being like, you know, like Russian oligarchs and stuff like that, all of a sudden have no idea what to do. It's really funny, actually. It's a deep, deep satire, but it's really funny. And um, yeah, it makes you think that, let's see, Max Carr says, I don't see Twitter lasting through 2023 under Musk management. He'll either sell it as a major loss or kill the company or both. I don't know. Am I the band of Hawk to your Lamborghini? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Griffith does exploit people uh, in his band of Hawk. I'm not saying that people aren't allowed to um, get rich. I just think you've got to... Treat your employees well and show them what they stand to gain if you want to get their buy-in for being a success. So I'm glad that Mike Hawthorne shared that statement. I found that, honestly, I found that probably the most interesting news of the week that I came across, what he shared. I thought that that was really interesting. I didn't understand how an artist could make so little. On a project what are you drawing right now let me show you I'm trying to draw guts here guts from berserk because earlier we talked about this is my pick for book of the week uh, the last berserk chapter written and illustrated by, by Kentaro Miura Tor and I had a situation with animation video editing job for a certain employer who thought they could swindle us. Ah, hmm, interesting. Interesting. Muy interesante. I guess that's all the big news that I had. I saw some people um, talking about some news that I guess I wasn't privy to. I, I remember somebody mentioned, what do I think of Ryan Gosling as Sentry? I, I didn't hear that that news was necessarily confirmed or anything. I did hear that the thinking is that Sentry might be the opponent in the Thunderbolts movie. Uh, which, okay. I'm willing to go along with that. We shall see. Ah, uh, Andrew Jefferson, that's so nice of you. We appreciate you. I even smashed the like button. Tell you what, I personally am okay if you just lightly press the like button. That still helps me the same, and you don't need to damage your personal computer. Doesn't manga industry also kind of exploitative? 
uh, the cultural uh, thing there where uh, people are absolutely driven to work tremendously long hours. Um, it, it, it's, I would argue, potentially more of a grind than even American comics because they turn out pages weekly and they have to sort of get those approved by an editor before they even like can start drawing for the most part. It's pretty intense. <clears throat> but I don't think that like it's really the company exploiting them so much as they've created that sort of a work culture in, for, for their comics. And I'm not saying it's right at all. I'm just saying that that's a, a piece of how the manga industry seems to work. I would love to talk more to um, someday to a working manga professional. I, I think that I would have so many questions about how it compares. But they're so busy that they honestly don't tend to do too many interviews. Certainly not with foreign media. But maybe someday I could get the channel to a point where it would be um, something valuable to them. There we go. There we go. If you got, could all just gingerly press the like button. If you could caress the like button. I think that that would, that would be lovely. Ever read the Thunderbolt story where they weakened at Bernie's the Sentry's body? No. Sounds interesting, though. Seeing mangaka burnout hit the page is always so distressing. You know, a lot of them are smart enough that they take breaks sometimes. They, 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 what's called go on hiatus. Um, and that's to protect their own sanity. Um, but once they're up and doing it, yeah, it's tough. That's also part of why they have assistance. Like, you know, uh, some manga artists will, you know, do as little as like the hands and faces. Somebody else is doing the bodies and the backgrounds and stuff like that. Um, it can be very different than the way we produce comics. And who's to say which way is better? I, I can say. They tend to have more ownership of what they create. Not full ownership always, but they usually have something like a 50-50 split with the publisher. Uh, and then the publisher works to help get them licensing deals on, you know, merchandise and animation and stuff like that. So there, there's, there's a potential positive economically to the way that they've arranged things. Let's see. I punched the like button really hard. Oh, well, I appreciate it. I touched the button. Thank you, Thank you all. I'll give everybody that, that mentions that they touch the like button, I will give a thank you to. Treat the like button like it's a baby that still has a soft spot, much like myself. <laughs> Let's see. Manga and anime industries are super exploiting and low pay for such labor-intensive work and a high cost of living in Japan. I'll be honest. I don't necessarily find the overall cost of living in, say, Tokyo to be that unreasonable. I don't think it's necessarily that much more expensive than, say, New York. I think it's, like, fairly similar. But as far as what they're asking for you out of work, yeah, that, that can be a little bit more. I agree with you there. This is fun to draw, but I'm, I'm definitely not going to be able to finish it tonight, so that's too bad. Thank you all for contributing with things like talking about uh, the your library uh, experience with comics and for your feedback on the Mike Hawthorne scenario where he was sharing his royalty statement. That's, that's all. That's what makes this interesting, I think, is getting feedback from other people, not just me. Let's see. A Drifting Life by Tatsumi is a wonderful autobiography in manga form. I, I've read several autobiographies of manga. It's 
or and biographies. It's really interesting. Let's see. I just sensually touched the like button. Thank you, Amen. And hey, if anyone was going to hit that thing, smash it, you'd think it would be somebody that's like Amen. It sounds like, you know, atom bomb or something. I remember Ichiro Itano almost died from working on directing Macross movies animation. Oh, I didn't know about that story. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, again, I think some of it's cultural. Well, here's my, my big takeaway, and I'm not an expert, so I could be wrong here. This is just my what I've observed. I could be wrong. But I think that Japan is very much a culture that does not want to um, stand out. That there's like from from the moment you're born, they're they're telling you, you know, like be part of the group, don't stand out, and 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 that's okay. But I think what it leads to when in the workplace is nobody wants to stand out as being like the first one to go home. So so people stay and work late. But I've also heard that that does not actually necessarily mean that there's more productivity because there'll be like you know just people sort of sitting in front of their computer doing sort of mindless stuff sometimes. If that's true, if I have that accurate, I think that that's too bad that they, that we can't, you know, but who knows as a new generation comes forward every year, we now have things like the internet and people get to see what other cultures are like, and that can broaden and change how, how a culture uh, treats things. And, and maybe people, Possibly, maybe I gave the like button a feathers touch, but then it didn't work, so I cracked my screen, smashing it. Good, thank you. That's what I want. I tapped the like button. Hey, as long as it acknowledged uh, the tap, then we're good. I did like the like button. You did like it. Okay, okay. I love going home. Okay. The like button is a-okay in my book. Um, let's see. I tried smashing the like button but missed. Now I'm too spent and disheartened to make another attempt. Mm. I flopped upon the like button. That's an interesting one. Let's see. That's what most Japanese say, yes, that Jap Japan is a very conservative society. If you like to stand out, you're considered selfish. I think that, though, that there's always some young people that are willing to stand out a little bit more, and I, and, and I think that their fellow young people don't necessarily uh, condemn them for it. So I think that, like, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing changes. It's just slow. Don't get me wrong. Hard work is good. I don't want to tell, like, say, like, hey, Japanese people. Lighten up. Don't work so much. No, hard work gets does move you forward. It does, but just don't do it at the exclusion of what really matters. Stuff like family and your own health, you know? Otherwise, you're not really working for a good reason, in my opinion. What do I know? What do I know? Let's see. I think John Carter's Day Live might help. Okay. Do I have any of the Berserk Deluxes? I have a bunch of them. I have, um, uh, I don't know, I think the first seven or eight. First seven or eight. And I think they're up to 10. They might be up to 11. But whatever, I, I also have these, the Tonka Bonds. So I've read it all. Um, I love it. I love it. I got to get my eyes back on the Fantagraphics sale. Yes. Remember, everybody, there's a sale on Fantagraphics stuff. Dang, I missed the whole stream. Was out shopping. For me? You shouldn't have. <laughs> um, anyway, this is probably a good time to, to wrap things up, but you all have really added to tonight's show, so I appreciate that. Also want to say that anybody that's watching this one, once it's archived, I really appreciate you too. That, that really helps. I know most people actually watch it once it's archived as compared to being able to watch it live. So it really, really I, I, I like it. Let's see. 
what are the most copies you have of a single story page panel? The most copies I have? Probably no more than two of anything at this point. Let's see. Can you wrap up with an impromptu wrap? Maybe if um, somebody gives me a topic. And it would probably like get pretty dirty and offensive, just to be clear. Thank you for the stream, Chris and everyone. Much appreciated. Is Hunter Hunter good? I need to know. I haven't read that one. I haven't read that one. Oh, there we go. Look, Tent Ringer says, I sucker punched that like button. I bet I've got a lot of likes this time, thanks to all of you. Rap about selling cars. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. Oh. Sold a car to a late man and a lady. Sold a car, made some gravy. Selling cars all damn day. Hurt my back. That's just the way. I'm rapping. Rapping about what? Rapping about cars. Cars that drive real far. Be a superstar by selling that car. Selling cars all day long. Selling cars. I don't do it wrong. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I have never claimed to be a professional rapper. Classic 80s flow, yes. Yes, I definitely first encountered rap or hip hop with uh, early 80s rappers. Your run DMC, Curse Blow, stuff like that. <laughs> I I'm hoping, Andy, that that's a reference to my favorite Mr. Show sketch where Professor Murder gets angry at Bob Odenkirk's rapping skills and says, damn, his science is too tight. If you haven't seen it, look up the monks versus the fat kids across the lake, Mr. Show, on YouTube. Best damn sketch ever. Bob Odenkirk's rapping is just amazing. Good, good. I'm glad I heard. Let's see. How feasible would a year-end in memoriam episode of Comic Tropes be for all the creators we've lost this year? I don't think I'd want to do that on Comic Tropes because I sincerely don't think it would get that many views. But what I might instead is, I, I've been thinking about this, I might do it as like sort of a news item on this show for the year-end, like talk about all the different creators we lost. Oh, I won't. Don't quit my day job. Don't worry. Will you miss dad's stuffing on Thanksgiving or mom's mincemeat pie? I love both, Jeannie. Um, you know, um, I'll probably miss the mincemeat pie a little bit more because I avoid sugar so much. Like stuffing, I, I could cheat a little and have like a little of that. It's got carbs, but it's not as bad for me as just outright sugar. So I'm not going to have pie. I just don't eat pie anymore. The telethon episode? Oh, <laughs> no! We're talking about the topic from last week that was about the topic two weeks back. <laughs> oh, that's my style of rap. Archmage Frey has it. Well, my name is Pace Puppy, and I'm here to say, don't use tape glue, because glue is the way. <laughs> I stuttered it. Oh, whatever. Um, everybody... Hey, what what am I thinking? This is Thanksgiving week. You know what? Before I just wrap it up, let's take a moment here. I would love to hear what in comic books are you thankful for? Is there anything you can think of like for like you could list a creator or a specific book or a comic book store or somebody that got you into comics? Something related to comics that you're thankful for. Let me see if I can think of one to start. Um, what am I thankful for within comics? I'm thankful for discovering uh, manga so somewhat later in my comic book reading career because there's just as much good and bad manga as there are comic books. So I'm very glad to have discovered that. and. Um, and found like a whole nother source of comics to read. So that's 
something on if you can artist or something. Uh, let's see. Okay. Jack Kirby in his fourth world. Um, yep. Thank you very much. I'm thankful for Greg Smallwood. Me too. I'm thankful for the artwork of Alex Nino. Yes. Great Filipino artist. I'm thankful for the decades of entertainment they have given me. Perfect. Thankful for my friends who collect comics with me. That does sound nice. That sounds really nice. I'm thankful for Hara Tetsuo changing shonen manga forever. Yes. Yes. Talking about something like Fist of the North Star. So much serious than most things. Um, Mad Magazine. Yes. I love Mad Magazine. I, Mad and Cracked as a kid. Comics that I loved. Exposed me to a lot of different styles. I'm thankful for Magneto. It's an interesting character, honestly. Deeper than many. I'm thankful for English releases of all these common Rider ma manga. Getting more recognition in the process. Good. I'm for a elementary school. Whoops. What did I do? That helped me to learn to read with comics. Oh, that's great. Wow. I'm thankful right now for Steve Sorensen's Super Chat. And Steve says, I'm thankful for fellow fans. I know I am not alone. That's true. That's true. None of us are. I'm thankful for Galactic Greg in Valparaiso, Indiana, for giving me a job and for Jeremy teaching me a lot. Good. Thankful for all the golden age of comics and the books that collect those stories. It's awesome to see what we came from. Uh, thankful for Norm Brayfogle. Ah, you're biased. You're my sister, but she's thankful for me. I'm thankful for you. I really am. I'm thankful for the YouTube comics community and channels like Comic Tropes and, I don't know, some obscure channel called Comic Pop. Sal who? Uh, this is great, folks. You guys are This is really nice to hear. Um, I'm thankful for the person who handed out comics for Halloween when I was a kid. Awesome. That's so fun. I'm thankful for Sam Keith turning me weird when I was young and Jeff Smith for turning me gentle. Isn't it amazing how much they can influence our personalities? They make us connect to other people through stories. That's what comics do. I'm thankful for the newspaper comics that got me into reading and making comics. Uh, Fragadol is thankful for pre-Bendis Daredevil. Okay. Certainly a lot of good Daredevil throughout the ages. Uh, let's see, the Geekery, Secret Stash, and Comic Crypt, my three local shops. Awesome. Heavy Metal, Vampirella, The Spirit. Those are all great things to be grateful for. Let's see. Happy Canadian Thursday, everyone. Exactly. <laughs> it's Thanksgiving for us. It's uh, Thursday for everybody else. Uh, I'll read all of these until we finish, and then I'll wrap it up. Thankful for Anna Hayfish's use of orange. All right. It's very specific. Thankful for Previews Magazine, which helped me discover so many indie titles. Worth pouring over sometimes, isn't it? Um, I'm thankful for James Gunn going to DC movies. Let's hope that he does some great stuff for, for us nerds. I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Thankful for Comic Drake and Casually Comics. Much respect to those channels, yes. I'm thankful for Pace Pop Pete. Bless you. You are not alone. Yes. I'm thankful for Robert Kirkman's works. Me too. Me too. Great guy. Great guy. I just found I have the live action Fist of North Star VHS. Oh, okay. Comic pop is some kind of soda. It, it could be. Tari says, I'm thankful for my cousin who introduced me to comic books as a kid. Got to be grateful for that kind of stuff, right? I'm thankful for my late dad for bringing home a bundle of Marvel comics when I was a kid and getting me into comics in the first place. That sounds like a really nice memory, Richard. Nice. I'm thankful for Astro Zombies in Albuquerque for hiring me for a year. Yes, got to be close to that stuff. Ah, I'm thankful for this. Andrew Jefferson, thank you. I'm thankful for the high school project I had on 19th century English poetry that got me into comics, I did the poem, Ozymandias. That's that's cool. I'm thankful for the hours I spend drawing superhero comics on my living room floor, getting my belly cold from drawing on the floor. Ah, that's, that's awesome. That's really cool. 
I'm thankful for Asterix Comics, which got me started reading comics. I'm going to do an episode on Asterix at someday. I, I, I will. I will. <laughs> You're thankful for poor Splint? Yes, I'm uh, such a dig gentleman. I don't uh, use paste pots. I use porcelain pots. I shit on them. <laughs> I'm thankful for the DCAU getting me into comics. Hey, absolutely. There's so many roads into comics. And by the way, when I just did that, I just got the sharpest pain from that damn knot in my back I was complaining about earlier. I've overdone it. I told you, if I sit for about two hours, I'm in extreme pain. So I got to go loosen up. I got to have some dinner. And then I'm going to, once I'm loose, I'm going to sit down and try to wrap up editing the next Comic Tropes episode. I promise it's a big one that I think a lot of people will like. Yes, I know. I try not to swear on the shows too much. If you, I don't at work either. But if you know me in person, I can be a bit of a potty mouth, to be honest. So it's sometimes it's a little hard for me to just not. I'll, I joke around a lot in real life, and I like getting a reaction. And sometimes getting that reaction just means going very blue with my humor. So just so you know a little something about me. <laughs> Um, get loose. I will. I will. Thanks, everybody. I, I had a good time talking with all of you. Happy Thanksgiving if you're here in America. Otherwise, happy th Thursday. I got to get to work making you guys some more content. All you have to do is keep reading more comics. More comics, yeah. Or keep reading comics. Something like that. Bye.